Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 is profound in different ways. First of all, it introduces the Messiah as the begotten Son of God. But it also points to uh, the earthly millennial reign of the King of Kings. And it is addressed to the rulers and judges of this earth. And it could not be more timely. Acts 4, verse 25 and 26 tells us that it is written by David. So there's no doubt about that. And if we look at the outline of this psalm, we see that it has um, two halves. The first one is about the rage, uh, or the rebellion of the nations, and the Lord's response. And the second half is about the Lord's decrees. First of all, the decree of the Son and then the decree for the nations. So it has a very clear outline. It's uh, actually in that respect easy to follow. So let's begin with verse 1, which speaks about a rebellion of the nation, nations. And so I put there in the outline the question what, although the psalm begins with the question why, but uh, I put there what because it explains that there is a rebellion. That is what is going on. So, Psalm 2 verse 1 reads, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? So the question is why? And it's a genuine question. Because there's no reason to rage against God. It's a vain thing. And there is no benefit to gain. In fact, it's a lost battle. But it is man's nature and... It is Satan's obsession. So let's look for a second what, uh, or actually who is um, rebelling against God. And two groups are mentioned. It's the nations and the people. Now the nations is often translated as heathen. Uh, implying that it concerns uh, non-Jews or Gentiles. There is somehow... Um, this delineation is made often between Gentiles and Jews, between uh, Israel and the other nations. Now, that is not, uh, in most cases, that is not, uh, not correct. Um, here we see that the word that is used for nations is goim. And again, goim is often considered to be all the others except the Jews. And that is... Uh, uh, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but uh, it's, it's maybe arrogance of the Jews to think, uh, to, to translate it like that, to in interpret it like that. Goim simply means nations or peoples. That's what it means. And it's the exact same word that God uses in Genesis 12 verse 2, where he promises Abram that, we will, that he will make out of him a great nation. A great Goya. It's the same word. And that nation we know would be Israel. So, and of course you can debate spiritual Israel, physical Israel and all this. I'm not going there. But the point is that this is a regular word for nations. Goim. And there is actually no reason to assume that the nations do not include Israel as well. How often do we not read in the Old Testament in particular uh, that Israel and Judah are rebelling against God? And actually this is continuing to this very day. So that's the first thing, the nations. The nations of the earth. The second thing is the people. And so this adds to the idea that Israel is included. It does not say other people. It... By the way, it also doesn't say other nations. Eh? The word um, Elohim for people um, means exactly that people or community can also be nation, by the way. 
So it's not just the kings and the rulers, but it comes down to the individual people. It's always easy to point to, to the, the rulers, to the regime, but um, ultimately they come to power because the people allow it, because the people have made it happen. Now one thing is clear, the opposition against God is a vain thing. So the question then remains, why? Why do they do it? They have no reason to do it, nor does it bring them anything. Let's move on to verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Here we read how this rebellion takes place. We see that it is organized. The kings and rulers of the world set themselves together. They get together. And right away, of course, you have to think of the United Nations, of G20, G7, uh, these kind of things, where the rulers of the world come together. They set themselves together and they make up things. And um, they are thinking, mistakenly, that together they have a better chance. It is not a new thing. It was exactly like that at the building of the Tower of Babel. And it will again be so at the second coming of Jesus. As we can read in Revelation 19 verse 19, it's again all the kings that bring the people and their armies together to, against the, the anointed. And there too it will begin with the kings, as we can read in Revelation 16 verse 14. It begins with the kings, and the kings then bring in all the people. The rage is not against God in general, and this is where it gets really profound, but it's against Christianity specifically. Because it says it's against the Lord and his anointed. Anointed in Hebrew is Messiah. It's the Lord God, Yahweh, and his Messiah. Uh, that's the word that's being used here. In Greek it would be Christos or Christos. And this makes this psalm both prophetic and profound. Now, the question is, why? What is the motive for this rebellion? And that is revealed in the next verse, in verse 3. There it says, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. They think that God puts them in bondage, that God limits them. They think that Jesus, jo uh, that Jesus' yoke is heavy and they want to get rid of it. And one could actually not be more deceived. It is a typical Luciferian inverted way of thinking. It shows how lost and deceived the world is. We know better. For example, in Isaiah 61, verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. This uh, verse is what Jesus uh, read um, in, uh, when he was in the synagogue, and actually he was referring to himself. He is that one that is anointed by God the Father. He is the Messiah. And um, he doesn't come to, to put people in bondage. On the contrary, it says here, uh, to, um, to open the prison to them that are bound. And uh, then later, of course, Jesus himself says in Matthew 11, verse 30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's the opposite of what the, the world thinks and that makes their whole undertaking to rage against God even more vain, more foolish. So how does the Lord respond to this? That is what we read in the following three verses and we begin with verse 4 where it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. The foolishness of man's rage could not be illustrated in a better way. 
Verse 2 speaks of the kings of the earth. But here it says, God who sits in the heavens. That in itself should settle the deal. What is man thinking? How possessed is he? What does heaven have to fear from the earth? He who created the earth and holds it in his hands is not impressed, he's not afraid, he's not shocked. In fact, he doesn't even rise from his seat. It says he sits in the heavens. He didn't jump up in panic, what's going on? No, he sits and he laughs. He simply laughs at their idiocy. Oh yes, God's response will be very serious. But his laughter underscores the vanity of man's rage. The Lord shall have them in derision. They will be made fools of. Then in verse 5 it says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yes, the Lord laughs, but he doesn't only laugh. He acts also. He acts against the rebellious mankind. And God has every right and every reason to act immediately. He's a righteous God, but he's also a loving and a merciful God. So, he speaks first. He speaks words of warning. What is God's great message to mankind? Verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. The kings of the earth have set themselves against God. And God tells them that he has a greater king established, a king of kings. And he established him in Jerusalem, Zion, on the earth. God from heaven has established a king on earth. And he is above all the kings of the earth. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The question may be, who is this king? And that is what God now declares in the rest, the next verses, not in the rest, but in the next three verses, uh, where it says, the decree of the Son. Verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. So you see, and I said it's also in the introduction, Psalms are like songs. They have different verses and sometimes a chorus, a bridge. Here, this is like a different verse in the song where no longer God the Father is speaking, but here it is the Son, the Anointed, the one that He has established as King on, over the earth. He is now speaking. So it's as it were that God introduces the son in verse 6 eh? yet i have set my king upon my holy hill of zion and then he says and here he is he will speak for himself and that that is exactly what we see in verse 7 when it says i will declare the decree that's jesus speaking that's the son speaking and what does he say uh, he says that uh, the father calls him my son whom i have begotten the Messiah, Christ, God's anointed, speaks and recalls what the Father call, calls him. Now we've um, found this verse also quoted in Hebrews 1 verse 5 when we went over the book of Hebrews. And there uh, it was uh, used as a proof of Jesus' deity. So God has not called anyone my son except Jesus. And then there is the word begotten, and that delineates from created. It shows that Jesus is the same essential nature and being as the Father. Jesus was not created, but rather everything was created by him. Paul declares in Colossians 1 verse 16 and 17, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Very powerful verse. 
And so what we read here in Psalm 2 is a, an extremely powerful declaration that the Messiah is the Son of God and is God. And this has been penned down by David about 1200 years before Christ. It is profound. Why? Because in the mindset of, um, of the Israelites, God could not have a son. And uh, Jewish people today still uh, hold on to that. It's impossible. And actually, they see it uh, as Christianity as idolatry for that reason. Um, but here we find the declaration by King David uh, in Psalm 2. There's no denial. Of course, um, rabbis explain this verse quite differently, or this whole psalm. But um, you have to really um, yeah, make a long stretch to get there the way they did explain it. We go to verse 8. So Jesus is still, sp still speaking and he says, he continues to say what the Father has told him. So verse 8 he says, Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Again, it's the Son declaring what the Father had told him. And that is that he will give him the nations, the Goim, as inheritance. All the nations, including Israel. It's the same word here, Goim, that we saw in verse 1. And so that, therefore we know it includes Israel, because Israel will also be uh, part of uh, Jesus' inheritance. So... This clearly has not been fulfilled during Jesus' first advent. It has not been fulfilled to this day. Right now, the earth is not ruled by Jesus. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it lies in the hands of the devil. And scripture clearly declares that. We read in John 12, verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So this is what Jesus is saying. There will be judgment, and then this prince will be cast out. Which, of course, we can read about in, in the book of Revelation. And um, in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 4, verse 4, it says, In whom the God of this world, that's the devil, hath uh, blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So yes, clearly what is declared in Psalm 2 has not yet been fulfilled. But things will change. Things will change dramatically. We can read in Revelation 11 verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, his anointed and he shall reign forever and ever. So there will come this moment towards the midst of the seven year tribulation that the tables will turn. And now the world will no longer be in the hands of Satan. It's slipping through his fingers as sand and Jesus will take control. There will still be a battle, but um, the, the tables have already turned. And this statement here in Psalm 2 is actually a prophecy of the millennial reign that will follow that, that we can read about in Revelation 20, verse 6. Uh, so that's after, obviously, uh, Revelation 20 is after Revelation 19, where we have the second coming, where we have this so-called Battle of Armageddon, uh, where the armies of the earth are defeated by the word that proceeds from Jesus' mouth. And then uh, verse 20 there it says, blessed, uh, sorry, Revelation 20 verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is a millennial reign that it speaks about. And we find it also in Zechariah 14 verse 9. Where it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, his name one. So, again, as I said in the beginning, Psalm 2 is profound in different ways. It declares that, there, that uh, the anointed is the Son of God, and he is God, and it declares, it prophesies also the millennial reign. 
in verse 9 Jesus continues to say what the father told him namely thou shalt break them with a rod of iron thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel Jesus will rule with righteousness but also with power he will judge the nations in John 5 verse 22 Jesus says for the father judged no man but hath committed all judgment unto the son so this only confirms what we just read in Psalm 2 verse 9 and Jesus has the power to break them into pieces like a clay pot with a rod of iron Psalm 110 uh, verse uh, 1 through 3 speaks also to that um, it's actually a psalm that goes hand in hand with Psalm 2, Psalm 110. And I pointed this also out um, when we went through the st our study of the book of Hebrews, where both are quoted in conjunction. Um, so Psalm 110, verse 1 through 3, it's a psalm of David. It says, The Lord said unto my Lord. And notice here that the Lord, uh, the first time is fully capitalized, the second time is uh, small, uh, it's only the L, uh, the first letter is capitalized. It's in the original language, it's Yahweh said unto Adonai. So the, the God the Father said unto the Son. So again, it goes hand in hand with what we read in Psalm 2. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord said, Shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. So here is the rod of iron of Psalm 2. Um, Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of thy of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. And in Zechariah 14, it speaks also of this millennial reign. I already read a verse from that. I will now read verses 16 and 17, where it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations, the Goim, which came against Jerusalem, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So here Jesus is referred to as the king. And that's what we just read in Psalm 2, uh, um, where God the Father says that he has established a king upon his holy hill Zion. So therefore it's foolish to defy the Lord and his anointed. It's a foolish thing. And so the last three verses of Psalm 2 are a decree to the nations. You can say an advice. Because now you know all this, take this advice and stop your rebellion. What is the advice? Verses 10 and 11 I read first. Be wise now therefore. O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. So after the words of warning, there is advice to the king, and the kings and the judges of the earth. Their defiance is foolishness, and it's time to be wise. Now what is wisdom? That could be the question, and it's beautifully defined in Job uh, chapter 28, verse 28, where it says, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil, that is understanding. That is exactly the advice here. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. These two words are used. Paul uses them, of course, he knew this, uh, this psalm very well. With fear and trembling, the kings of the earth are called to surrender and to submit, to give God honor, the honor that he deserves, and, and reverence, and deep respect, and in that rejoice. So it's not fear and trembling and feeling, uh, feeling miserable in that, no, it's having joy in that, rejoice. Um, rejoice with trembling, it says. Uh, it's the same joy that Psalm 1 verse 1 speaks of, uh, pointed out the other time. 
And uh, we see that um, in Psalm uh, 31, verse 19, it, it also links this, uh, this joy to fear, fear of the Lord. How great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. It means that res deeply respect thee, that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons, sons of men. There is great goodness waiting for those great goodness and certainly not bands and courts that uh, the kings of the earth think uh, and that they want to break and so the last verse of psalm 2 then says kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him the attention goes to the son the only way to the Father. Again, it's profound. It's profound. It, the, the, the psalm could have stopped at verse 11. But no, there is this additional verse that says, go through the Son. That's the way to the Father. You cannot serve God without submitting to the Son. And this kiss is a kiss of submission. It was actually customary uh, for an inferior to kiss a dignitary. Uh, you see... Some remnants of this, for example, not that I agree with this, but just to, uh, as an illustration, uh, when uh, people meet, for example, the Pope or, or Cardinals, they, they kiss their hand or their ring even. And um, that's a kiss of submission. Uh, the kings and the judges and all of us are called to humble ourselves before the anointed, before the Messiah, the Christ. The kiss is also a token of friendship and affection. We see the contrast with this foolish rebellion which leads uh, to being dashed to pieces, to pieces and to perish, um, to be broken with a rod of iron. And on, on the contrast uh, to that is to rejoice. Those who trust in him are blessed. It's the word ashre that we, we learned in Psalm 1. To be happy, to be fulfilled. Defy God and perish, or surrender to Him and be blessed. And this is our choice. This is our choice. To be broken or to be blessed. To follow the kings of the earth and perish, or to follow the King of Kings and live. Amen. Amen.